How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Happy are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Welcome to Salem United Church of Christ and this version of our worship for July 19th. We are glad that you are part of our life together as we live out and reach out with the love of God. We begin our worship with a responsive call to worship. Come, let us love the Lord our God with heart and soul and mind and strength. Let us have done with lesser things and love God with an undivided heart. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. please let's be together in a prayer of confession. Lord our God, we confess we have not loved you as we should. We have professed love, and our profession has been true. But our profession has not always been evidenced in action. We have loved you in word, but not in deed. It can hardly be said that we are passionate in our religion, We keep you at a distance, yet we want you on call. We come to you when it is in our interest, but seldom out of the sheer delight of being with you. O Lord, we hate to say it, but we fear it is true. We use you more than we love you. Please forgive us and help us to love as Jesus loved. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks and praise be to God. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, our only God, we love you. And we seek the bliss of this time of praise and prayer in the holiness of your presence. We love you because you hear us when we call and you attend to our cry. You forgive us when we go astray and you find us when we are lost and bring us home. You understand us even when we don't understand ourselves 
and you guide us when we are perplexed. Above all, we love you because you are good and you are great. And a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Our congregation has many for whom we wish to pray. Doug Smith, who is recovering from a fall. Linda Beery and Mary Jane Legler, who are hospitalized. Kathy Kwilinski's extended family member, Jerry. And Pat Mackler, McCarthy's brother, Mike, uh, both of whom um, have cancer diagnoses and surgeries, and others on our prayer list from recent days. Sue Rotar, Tom Bass, Chuck Hart's parents. Send to each what is needed and make this a day of blessing. But for many, this is a day of trouble, and we look to you for the help and hope of heaven. Our nation has become a valley of the shadow of death, Walk with the sick, the weary, and the dying. Save essential workers, those who do the lowliest of jobs for the most meager of pay at the highest of risk. Support those who can't escape hard work, who can't find other work, and who would love to find some work. Help us all battle against impatience, imprudence, impudence, and impotence in the face of disease. Give our leaders moral courage to take the path that is right and sensitivity to care about how their policies affect people elsewhere. Grant us eyes and ears to spot false prophets a mile away and charlatans from a distance. Keep us all ever attentive to the Good Shepherd who taught us to drink from his well to feed in his pasture, to dwell secure in his fold, and to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A scripture reading from the Good News Bible, John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Jesus and Peter. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord, he answered. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my lambs. A second time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered, You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. A third time Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter became sad because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, You know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. I am telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. In saying this, Jesus was indicating the way in which Peter would die and bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, Follow me.
There was once a preacher, Charles Kingsley was his name. He'd be 200 years old now. But it said that Charles Kingsley would start each one of his sermons by leaning across his pulpit and saying somberly to his people, here we are again to talk about something important to your soul and to mine. Well, that's just exactly what Jesus does with you now. Jesus comes up to you and sits beside you or stands beside you and says, I have something serious I'd love to talk with you about. The interview that Jesus wants to have with you is modeled after the interview that Jesus had with the disciple Peter, a conversation that's recorded in John chapter 21. If we listen with care, if you listen with care to that conversation, you'll better be able to imagine the interview that Jesus wants to have with your soul. The interview the Lord wants to have with your soul is a purposeful interview. Jesus had an agenda when he sat down to talk with Peter that day. Someone who has written about how to get things done has said that much more is accomplished if every meeting has an agenda and if every telephone call and every personal visit has a a purpose behind it that is seen to. Well, Jesus had a purpose when he sat down and talked with Peter that day, and he saw to it straight away. Jesus wanted to rehabilitate Peter. Peter Peter was in pieces. His whole life was in pieces because he had denied Jesus. And his life was in pieces not only because he had denied Jesus, but because the denial had come so easily. Jesus had predicted that one of the disciples would betray him and that all the disciples would desert desert him. Peter stood up and he said, not me, Lord, not me. I'll never desert you. I'll never deny you. All these others may, but I never will. Well, it wasn't long and the rooster crowed the truth into Peter's ear that he had denied Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. And before the crow of that rooster faded away, Peter's life was in pieces. He was ashamed of himself. He was a broken man. And he went out and wept bitterly. Well, now Jesus comes up to him. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus comes up to Peter to rehabilitate him, to rebuild him, um, to let him know that he's forgiven and to restore his confidence and his self-esteem. Well, I have no idea, I have no way of knowing what Jesus might want to uh, do with you, what kind of purpose Jesus has in speaking with you, but we can be sure that he wants to accomplish something in you, for you, with you, or through you. Uh, maybe to lift you out of some sadness. Maybe to send you into some service. It, 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 it may be to bring you to your senses. It may be to help you realize something. I don't know. Maybe you don't know. Or maybe you do. Whatever it is. Jesus has a clear purpose in mind, and the interview that he wants to have with you has an agenda to it. Jesus has a purpose that he wants to accomplish. The interview the Lord wants to have with your soul is a serious interview. Peter knew that Jesus was a funny man, a funny, funny man. Peter had been around that day that Jesus jokingly spoke about that fellow with the log in his eye who went around pointing out specks in other people's eyes. He was around that day that Jesus sort of made fun of the pompous Pharisees who were full of themselves and walked around in their long robes with their long words that uh, were very short on any kind of meaning or truth. And Peter knew also that Jesus was the one who gave him his funny nickname. 
Peter, after all, you remember, was not his real name. It was his nickname. Peter, you may also recall, um, means rock. Jesus called Peter Rocky. And I think, I think, you know, I've told you before, this is, this is, uh, this is one of the questions I have when I get to heaven. I want to verify my thesis. My theory is that Jesus gave, uh, the New Testament doesn't say it this way, but my theory is that Jesus gave uh, Peter the nickname Rocky that day out on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water and Peter asked if he could come out and walk on the water too and Jesus invited him out and Peter was out on the water and he was doing fine and then started to sink and Jesus reached out and rescued him and brought him back in the boat and, and I think Jesus and all the disciples started laughing at him and joking about how he started to sink like a rock. I think that's the day they started calling him Rocky. But not today, not in this interview. Jesus doesn't call Peter Rocky in this interview. He uses his full name, Simon, son of John. Because sort of the way parents do when they mean business with their kids. I can still hear my mother's voice in my ear. Mark Edward, when I call you, I want you to come. She meant business then. Jesus didn't call Peter, Peter, here, he meant business, used his full name, Simon, son of John. It's serious what Jesus wants to say to you. Some of that serious comes out in the liturgies of the church. Full names are used at baptisms and confirmations, at least at the start of weddings, and full names are used at funerals. You have a sense of hearing your full name at other times in your life as well, and maybe especially now in this pandemic when everything is so topsy-turvy and upside down, so strange and so unsettled. It's a time when Jesus isn't messing around. And he calls you by your full name in a serious way. I want to have a talk with you. It's a personal a purposeful interview, it's a serious interview, and it is a personal interview. This interview that the Lord wants to have with your soul, it's a personal interview. Uh, I went to the eye doctor the other day. I hate going to the eye doctor. I always say I'd rather go to the dentist any day than the eye doctor. I, if I go to the dentist, all I've got to do is lay back in the chair, open my mouth, and they can do what they need to do. I don't need to participate in any way other than to be there. But at the eye doctor, there's pressure. I have to answer questions. Which is better, A or B? One or two, A or B, one or two. On and on and on it goes, so many questions. And if I get any of them wrong, if I get any of them wrong, then my prescription is going to be wrong. And if my prescription is going to be wrong, my glasses are going to be wrong, my vision is going to be wrong, and I'll have made a mess of it. There's a lot of pressure on, but I can't send anybody else. I have to sit in that chair for my eye exam. No proxies, no substitutes. So it was for Peter. He had to answer for himself on this day. There was a time, there was a time when Jesus said to all the disciples, who do people say that I am? You know, what's the word out on the street? What are other people saying? And they gave answer. Well, then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And, and, and the you that's there, who do you say that I am, is plural. Jesus is speaking to all the disciples. And they give, Peter's the one who gives the answer, but it's, it's for all of them. Well, here, the you is singular. Simon, son of John, do you love me? No proxy, no substitute. He, Peter has to answer for himself. And you have to answer for yourself. Can't send anyone else to the eye doctor. You can't have anybody else walk through the metal detector for you. When Jesus calls you, he wants you to come. It's a serious interview. It's a personal interview that Jesus wants to have with your soul.
And the interview Jesus wants to have with your soul is also an emotional interview. Here we get to the heart of the matter, I think. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now there, love. Um, the Latin version of my text, and here I have to, I have to stop and give a, give a shout out to one of my sons-in-law, Chris. He, 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 he loves Latin in church. So in the, in the Latin version of my text, Chris and others, in the Latin version of my text, the word that's used for love here is um, a word that means not simply love, but choose. Choose um, and prize and highly esteem. Um, almost like that old wedding ceremony when the, the couple was asked, uh, each one, um, do you forsake all others and take this one Always keep this one for yourself. That's a different matter. It's quite a different matter. Do you love me? It's quite a different matter than do you believe in me? Believing, well, that's an intellectual question. That can be settled through study. That can be um, analyzed through weighing the evidence. Um, do you believe in me is, is a matter of the head. But this is a matter of the heart. Do you love me? To see the difference between belief and love, we can think about the, uh, the demons of the New Testament. I don't want to get too far into any kind of uh, New Testament demonology, uh, but we can simply think about those, those, those characters as um, uh, characters who are antithetical to Jesus. Well, in the New Testament, the, the demons knew Jesus. They understood Jesus. They consented to Jesus' powers. They believed in Jesus. But they didn't love him. They didn't choose him. They didn't forsake all others for him. And that's the difference between love and belief. Do you love Jesus? That's the question. That's the, the essence of this interview that Jesus has with Peter, and it's the essence of the interview that Jesus has with you. I don't know the work that Jesus wants to accomplish in your life. I don't know how far down in the dumps you are. I don't know how confused you are. I don't know how weary you are. I don't know how fallen apart you are. I don't know how many pieces you are in. But the work Christ wants to do in your soul begins with this. Do you love him? Do you love Jesus? That's the starting point. That's the building block. Uh, that's the first step. Do you love him? Do you choose him? Somebody once said, hold to Christ. Hold to Christ and for all the rest be totally uncommitted. That's a pretty good philosophy. The interview that the Lord wants to have with your soul is a purposeful interview, a serious interview, a personal interview, an emotional interview. And the interview the Lord wants to have with your soul is also a missional interview. And by that I mean every conversation that Jesus has uh, issues in a call to action. John 21 opens with Peter saying, I'm going fishing. And our text moves to Jesus saying, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Now, there's a metaphor there, a metaphor that I want to draw out. But I know, I know that the metaphor I'm about to draw out doesn't work perfectly. I know that. But, but please focus along with me on the part that does work. Uh, the metaphor is this. A fisherman takes, but a shepherd gives. I know if you spin that metaphor out uh, completely, it, it doesn't work. Um, it's not perfect. Because fishermen don't simply take, they, they also supply food. Um, and, and shepherds uh, don't simply nourish the sheep, they... they Shepherds know what lamb tastes like. They, they know the flavor of mutton. 
So the image doesn't work perfectly, but work with me um, on the part that does. To fish is to take. To shepherd is to sustain. Jesus calls this fisherman, I'm going fishing, this one who wanted to take from the sea. Jesus calls the fisherman to be a shepherd. Tend my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my flock. See to the lives of others. See to it that they are nourished. See to it that they are cared for. See to it that they are safe. See to it that they are secure. The call Jesus speaks to us is not a call to selfish enjoyment, although there's nothing wrong with enjoyment. It's not a call to self-care, although there's nothing wrong with self-care. The call of Jesus is fundamentally a call to other care, to mission, to care for the neighbor, to care for the other, to see that their lives are sustained and nourished. So love Jesus. Love Jesus. Love him so passionately that his concern becomes your concern. Live for Christ. Live for others. And there's enough life for you in that as well, and plenty of it. Let us pray. We love you, Lord Jesus. We do. Help us to love you. And help us to love you more and more each day that we live. And help us to show our love for you by loving all those who are around us, even and especially those who are last and least and lonely and afraid, and by themselves. In your name we pray. Amen. the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>